Hello, welcome back. We're looking at the checklist for corporate formation and contribution. Specifically, this deals with Section 351. Now remember, whenever you're tackling the consequences of both parties, of the transfer or shareholders and the corporation transferee, you have to consider six steps in order. The first three steps deal with the transfer wars. The last three steps, steps four through six, deal with the transferee corporation. In the last video, we were considering Section 351A, which is a general rule that allows for non-recognition of the transfer or shareholder. That's in step one. We have yet to consider Section 351B, and that's the purpose of this video. In 351B, it provides a special non-recognition rule when the second requirement of the 351A checklist is not met. However, the requirements one and three must be met. Let's do a refresher on the 351A checklist just to recall the first three requirements. So the first requirement is a transfer of property to a corporation by one or more persons. In the previous video, we talked about what is property, what exactly transfer is. The second requirement is solely in exchange for stock in such corporation. It's possible that a transferor can receive property other than stock in the corporation. However, if that's the case, non-recognition under Section 351A is not available. But you'll see in 351B, it's still possible. The third requirement is that immediately after the exchange, such person or persons are in control of the corporation. This dealt with the immediately after requirement, as well as what exactly control is, which we learned 80% or more of all classes of stock and all voting classes of stock. If the first and third requirements are met, so requirements one and three are met, then you're on your way to non-recognition. However, if you fail either of the requirements, you fail either requirement one or three, you're not going to get non-recognition treatment under the contribution and formation rules for corporations. If we get requirement two, solely in exchange for stock, there's no boot, then 351A applies. Again, that was the subject of the first video in the checklist for section 351 and formation contribution. But what happens if we meet requirements one and three, but not requirement two? Well, then we have to go to step two, and that's the purpose of this video. Step two considers Section 351B, which may provide some non-recognition availability. So we use Section 351B checklist only after considering the 351A checklist. We have to go to 351A first. Again, ordering is important. If the transaction does not qualify for non-recognition under 351A, then please come to the 351B checklist. Recall that 351 is not an elected position, it's mandatory. The first step of the 351B checklist is do we meet requirements one and three? If so, we continue, we continue on. If not, we have to stop, you can't get 351A or 351B. And you must recognize gain or loss on the transaction under section 1001C, and the transferor takes a cost basis in the stock received under section 1012. If we continue, meaning that we meet the requirements, questions one and three, but we do not meet the solely in exchange for stock requirement, meaning that we do have boot, then we have to continue. There's two types of boot to consider. The first is boot other than liability assumption. Boot other than liability assumption is any property received by the transferor other than stock in the corporation, and that does not deal with liability assumption. If the transferor receives this kind of boot, then the transferor must recognize gain, but never loss. The idea here is that there was some anti-abuse. What shareholders would do is that if there was a loss, they would specifically require the corporation to provide them with boot so they could take the loss. This is an anti-abuse rule. Must recognize gain, but never loss. Very important. Never loss. Loss cannot be recognized under 351B. If there is boot, the rule is the amount of gain that must be recognized is the lesser of the amount of boot received 
or the realized gain on the transaction. So you compare whichever one is lesser and you pick one or the other. Whichever one's lesser, you pick that. So you look at the fair market value of the boot or the amount of cash received, right? And you compare that with the realized gain on the transaction. Now the character of the gain, the character of the gain will be the same as if the shareholder sold the respective property related to the transaction. Okay, not the property received, the property that's being transferred. It's in reference to the character of the asset transferred. That's what you look at when you look at the characterization. Now note that if there's any recapture issues under section 1245 or other types of recapture issues, then you have to take that into account. Okay, recall that section 1245 deals with the recapture of depreciation on personal property or amortization on personal property, right? You have to recapture. If more than one asset's transferred, the gain is allocated proportionally based on relative fair market value of the assets transferred. So we're talking about here is if you have different characterizations due to different assets transferred, you allocate using fair market value. Now, installment sales make things very difficult. But we're not going to go in too much detail with that. It's important to note that the transferor, the transferor's basis in any boot is always cost basis, which is the fair market value at the date it's received. If the transferor does not receive boot other than assumption of liabilities, then guess what? We continue. There is no boot with respect to this question too. The next part of the checklist, when we continue, does the transferor have any boot with respect to liability assumption by the corporation? Let's say you have a shareholder, Orange. Orange transfers a building to a corporation in exchange for stock. The building has a fair market value of $100, adjusted basis of 30, and a liability on the building which the corporation is going to assume of 50. When considering whether the liability, the $50 on the building, being assumed by the corporation is considered boot to orange, liability assumption is not considered boot. That's the general rule. However, there's two special cases where it can be considered boot. And those are section 357B that deals with liabilities for tax avoidance purposes. Also, when the aggregate liabilities of all properties exceed the adjusted basis aggregate basis in the transaction. Those are the two. So tax avoidance rule is the first way you can have boot with liability assumption. The second way is when the liabilities, the aggregate liabilities and all properties transferred exceed the aggregate basis of all properties transferred. Okay. But again, general rule boot does not include liability assumption. Now, if you do have boot from a li liability assumption, again, it's the same rule. You have to recognize gain, but never loss. The idea is that whatever amount of the liability assumption is considered boot, we treat that as boot, just like we do in question number two above. And it's the same analysis. It's the lesser of the boot or the realized gain. Again, you can't take a loss. Let's go through tax avoidance. The first one, tax avoidance, that deals with liabilities where the transferor specifically took out money not related to the business because the transferor knew about this special rule. Okay, now the IRS loves to use bright line rules, five year rules, whatnot. Generally speaking, if a liability has been taken out within five years and it's used with respect to some personal purpose, not related to the asset that it's attached to. A lot of times in the problems, you'll see purchase money indebtedness on the actual property. That is not a tax avoidance liability. That is a pure business purpose because you use the liability proceeds 
to acquire the asset. It's like putting, it's like having a secure liability or secured mortgage on the property. Let's assume that Orange's liability is a, is a purchase money mortgage where it was secured on the actual property, on the building. So basically, Orange took out a liability to acquire the building, which the building itself is what the security used for the bank, big boy bank. But let's say that instead, Orange took out the $50 liability, and that $50 liability was for some personal purpose, I don't know, to pay off Orange Orange's son, Lemon's, college tuition. Okay, something personal. That doesn't work. All right? Again, five-year rule. So if there's a personal, let's say within five years, then it's considered tax avoidance. Now, the entire amount of any liability assumption, all liabilities, not just on that property, all liabilities, they all are considered boot. So 357 is what we call strong arm language. It makes all liabilities, all liabilities boot if it applies. Now, the second rule, the second exception to the general rule where we do see boot from liability assumption is when liabilities exceed the basis. Consider our example. Orange is only transferring one item, a building. The building has an adjusted basis of 30 and a liability of 50. So that means the liability is greater than the adjusted basis, which is exactly what this says. If the aggregate liability is exceed the aggregate basis, you have boot. The boot is the excess. It's the excess. It's going to be the 50 minus the 30, the 20. So 20 is considered boot. And again, we apply that 20 to the special rule under number two above. So go see, see that again. Now what happens if 357B, which is this right here, the tax avoidance, and 357C, the excess rule both apply. If both apply, then 357B, the tax avoidance rule, trumps. Because that one gets all of the liabilities. It gets all of them. Now when you're doing this test, again, it's the aggregate. The aggregate amount of liabilities and the aggregate bases. So if Orange was contributing cash and a building, you add up the basis of the cash and the basis of the building and compare the amount of the liability. If Orange contributes two buildings, two adjusted bases, and two liabilities, you add up the bases and you add up the liabilities and you compare. It's an excess. It's an excess number. Accounts payable is not considered a liability with respect to this issue. Again, 357B, which is the tax avoidance rule, that takes precedence over 357C if both apply. The character is going to be allocated in proportion to the relative fair market value. So if you're contributing multiple assets and only one has a liability but it creates gain, you do all, all of the assets, not just the asset that has the excess liability. 